everyone, welcome back. Um, let's look at section one three. Um, these are acceptable, acceptable methods of data collection. So essentially these are good ways to collect data. So let's start with some definitions and then we'll find, we'll get into those good ways of collecting data. So our first definition is a census. You might've heard of it because we're doing the census this year. The census is the act of taking data from the entire population. All right, taking the, the, the US census is taking data from every single person in the United States, at least that's the goal, um, rather than just taking a smaller sample of people. So it's the entire US rather than just a sample. And again, a sample is a part. So rather than taking just a sample or a part of the population, we're taking the entire population. So the US Census attempts to be a census, um, but we end up missing some people, about one to 3%. So let's look at some examples of what's a census versus not a census. census. So our first example is a poll um, of college students at a pop-up window in their online registration form. Students have to answer the survey questions before they can register. And then we try to catch everyone else at the admission window when they register in person. So if every single student had to register online, this might be a census. Um, but as we know, some students don't register online, they register in person. And then when it just says try to catch, it makes me think they don't catch everyone. So I would argue that this one is not a census. We might miss a few students. What if we weigh every student at an elementary school for a study of physical fitness at the school? So there's a nice keyword here. The keyword is every, right? If we're at the school, we can definitely like force every child to get weighed. Is it necessarily a good thing to weigh students? Maybe not, but we are weighing every single student. So this would be a census. And our final one is survey parents whose children attend local elementary school by randomly selecting 50 parents. And that's my big hint, right? 50 is only a part. So this is not a census. Um, so it would obviously be nice to always take a census because our data would be really good, um, but we can't. Um, so let's talk about disadvantages of just taking a sample. So example A and C were samples, right? Because they're not everyone. Um, so some and a disadvantage would be sampling error. It should make sense that samples are going to vary a little. Um, and not be exactly the same as the population. If I surveyed the class, your average age, right? That's different than a, the average age of a different class. It's just gonna be a little bit different. They might be close, but they'll be a little bit different. Unfortunately, we can't always take a census for multiple reasons. First, it's extremely time consuming, right? Surveying every single person in the US is time consuming. Even every single person at Chabot. Um, it can often be expensive. And then sometimes it's not even possible. An example of impossible could be like crash testing cars. You can't crash test them all. So our goal right now is to think of good sampling methods. So when we do find a sample, it's at least making good approximations um, versus bad samples. They just give us bad statistics. Um, so let's look at what a bad sample would be. Um, we're curious about just maybe workers in the US and Canada. And let's say we go to Chabot and survey at Chabot. That's a bad sample, right? We'd have lots of teachers, right? We'd have lots of people in education. This is not representative. Lots of people in education. 
we'd probably have too many people in education. Or even if you went to the mall on like a Thursday afternoon. Right, you're gonna miss a lot of people who are typically working in the day. So again, it's not representing workers in general. And so this is what we call representative. We want our samples to be representative, and we'll get into this more, rather than biased. So what do these words mean? So we'll get into representative and biased. So representative is good, biased is bad. Representative would be um, a sample that contains the relevant characteristics of the population in the same proportion. And I don't want to do yellow, proportion. So when I surveyed at Chabot, I would proportionally have way too many people in education. There'd be a lot more people in education than there normally are. Um, and we could also think of proportions as percents. So maybe there's like 10% of the population is in education, but if I survey at Chabot, right, now we have 100%. So those percents are not proportional. And then bias would be prejudice toward or against one thing, um, person, group, compared to another, usually in a way to be considered unfair. So again, my survey at Chabot was bias towards education or bias towards teachers, because there'd be too many teachers. So I have, I think, two more examples, or, and then we will get into some, or just one more example, and then we will get into good sampling methods. So you could look this up too if you want more details on this next example, you could Google it. Um, but in 1936, Democrat Franklin Roosevelt and Republican Alf Landon were running for president uh, before the election, right? This feels so long ago. And things are different now because we have the internet, but um, they used magazines to survey people and to get out news. Um, so they surveyed, uh, um, Literary Digest surveyed 10 million people, 10 million Americans, determined how they would vote. Um, they sent out questionnaires and they sent, they mailed them out to the 10 million adults um, and they got the names and addresses from subscribers to the magazine, phone books, and car registration. Um, and then 2 million people ended up replying, right? Not all 10 million will reply. Um, and then we find out that 60% support Landon. So they think Landon will win the election. So they go ahead and publish it that Landon won. Um, and however, Roosevelt defeated Landon in one of the largest landslides in presidential elections ever. So this is a bad sample, right? They collected data from 2 million people, which sounds great. Um, but they collected bad data. So this is an example of collecting bad data. We can make statistics say anything if we collect bad data. So we really wanna make sure we're using good methods. So what went wrong here, which feels a little out of touch in the 2000s, um, but they only went to um, subscribers of their magazine, phone books, and car registration, which in the 30s, those were richer people Wealthier, that's a better word. Wealthier people had cars and phones and magazines. Who also tend to be more Republican. So essentially wealthy people were overrepresented. Wealthy people, it was biased towards wealthy people, which is not representative of the entire US. not representative. So I'll give you a second to catch up with all that. And be sure, again, if you have questions, write them down, send them to me right away.
And if I'm ever going too fast, right, you can pause the video. But so this is, you may have heard of a Gallup poll. Uh, maybe not, but it's still around, Gallup. Um, so this new up and coming pollster Gallup, George Gallup made his first prediction in the third, in 36, um, the same exact year as his poll. Um, and he only surveyed 50,000 people compared to the 2 million, um, but that was actually a better poll. Um, so he actually had the correct pred prediction with only 50,000 people, and that's because he used this thing called random sampling, which is a good way to collect data, and we will get into that in a second. So let's look at simple random sampling. This is like one of the best ways to collect data, and you can usually make really good predictions if you collect data with a good method. So we have simple random sampling. Sometimes it's abbreviated SRS just to write less, but it's a procedure for which each possible um, sample um, of a given size is equally likely to be chosen. So every single person has the equal chance of being chosen. Um, the easiest thing to think of is like picking random numbers. Um, oftentimes we assign numbers to people or things and that's the easiest way to do random. So we can do names from a hat. Um, we can do a random number generator. Um, unfortunately, our human brain does not produce random output. We all have preferences. Um, so we have to use other things. So if you do have the graphing calculator already, I'll normally display it, but I'm not going to display it on this video, but in the future I will project the calculator. Um, but if you've already purchased the calculator, you can go ahead and um, pull it out. You're going to see a button that says math. So math should be, um, if you look at the top left, it's the third button down. So you'll hit math and you'll see this menu and then you'll hit the arrows to go over to PRB. So everything on the calculator is using arrows to maneuver. So you'll go over to PRB. Some of them say PROB, but you'll hit the right arrow until you get to PRB. And then you'll hit the down arrow to get down to um, random int. Uh, most of the menus match, but sometimes it might be a different number, so I won't assign by number. Look for random int, which stands for random integer. And then I'm going to tell it 1 through 25. So I'm telling it the range of numbers to look at. Um, comma is next to the parentheses. It's right above 7. You'll see the comma right above 7. And then you're going to tell it how many numbers you want. So we want three. And then you just hit enter. And this time I got six, 17, and five. I will display the calculator next time. I just um, need to get the app set up on my iPad. But if you hit enter again, you'll notice you get different numbers. So last time I got those numbers, this time I'm getting 6, 17, 5, and then 11, 25, 5, right? These are three random numbers. So you should see this on yours. Another cool thing you can use is if you don't have a calculator yet, you can go to random.org. And it'll generate random numbers for you. So check that out if you don't have the calculator. Um, it's always, this could be a good way to decide dinner if you don't know where to go. Right? Assign each restaurant one, two, three, four, five, and let random.org decide for you. Then you don't have to make any decisions. So I'll be sure to display the calculator next time. Um, feel free to send me pictures of your calculator if you're having issues. That's a really good way to get help with the calculator. And then last thing I forgot to address, without replacement just means no repeats. 
So you can't have the same number twice. And if you do get the same number twice, just do it again. All right, one final example in this video, and then we'll get into other sampling methods in the later video. So let's look at this really quickly. Um, so I'm gonna randomly select five circles, which random is kind of hard again, right? Our human brain isn't random, so it's not gonna be truly random, but let's select circles. So do that as fast as you can, just pick five circles. Um, do you think you chose um, a representative representative circles? So I think the issue with mine, and probably most of us, is we chose larger circles because they're easier to select, um, right? We probably didn't pick these little ones. Maybe you did because you were thinking about it. But if you just chose randomly really fast, you probably were more likely to choose the bigger ones. So I would argue that mine is not representative because I chose larger circles. Um, if you had a different outcome, let me know. Um, so I'll see you in the next video for other acceptable sampling methods.